Buddha finger lemon tree. And these all get really a bright orange and then you just slice them off so you got these little pieces of lemon. I planted this in um, March, just a little seedling. So it's really, uh, it's really doing well. This used to be all bird pens out here. And by birds, I mean parakeets, lovebirds, cockatiels, and finches. So this is 8,000 square feet of bird pens. There was another 12,000 square feet that I tore down last year. Um, these buildings are unfortunately falling apart. And when I was a kid, my dad and I built all this stuff. You can see all the nest boxes. So that we had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of birds in here. And it goes all the way back. So there's three more, there's three of these total for like I said, 8,000 square feet. So these had a lot of cockatiels in them. It was a big operation that we had. We were buying and selling probably, I would say half a million pet birds a year. And then we were selling 50,000 pounds of bird feed a month to different people that raise birds for us. So we'd have a big truck come every, every month with 50,000 ton, 50, pounds, 25 tons, usually in 100 or 50 pound bags. And so we'd have to unload it all, unload it into a feed building. So imagine there was thousands of birds in here and the, the volume at nighttime when I'm falling asleep, if it's really quiet, I still hear the birds chirping in my head because there were so many of them. It's embedded in there now. There's something quite beautiful here because you have this, the symmetry of the bird cage wire and then you have now there's this, these spider webs and it's this chaos mixed combined with order. I think that's all had a big impact on me and my work. The fields around here is the same way and these, you have these orchards with these, these rows of trees or rows of corn but then the trees are completely organic so that it's this duality this dichotomy of the two that make up the whole. This is a California peppercorn tree. I planted it when it was just a little seedling many, many, many years ago. And now it's quite big. It's beautiful. It's, I like the way it just kind of drips down. Okay, this is my Ford tractor. We used to have an old Ferguson here came with the property that when we bought it and I think the tractor was from the 1940s or 50s and it ran great and then it just the piston heads froze up and the engine block cracked so that was it but I bought this a couple years ago two weeks ago I had all this fencing out here and we used to have emus hundreds of emus out here you know the big ostrich like birds back in the 80s, late 80s and 90s. And then that business went away. And so um, we had three remaining emus and I, I gave them away to a animal sanctuary a month ago. Just to, uh, I want to turn this, it's about an acre right here. I want to make this into uh, plant some vineyards in January. I'm thinking about a petite Syrah. So in order to do all that, I had to get all the fencing out, I had to pull out all the fence posts. And then Monday, I've got this pipe running out here and I'm gonna start flooding this field because I gotta get the soil moist. And then we're gonna rip it with a big tractor and get the soil churned up. And then I can start disking it. And we'll just go back and forth and back and forth and get it ready for January when I'm gonna plant the, uh, the grapes. So this is a water tower. There's a big tank up there. And this other little building here was a, the well and they would get pumped up to there and then from there it would feed the whole property. And you see here, it says on this, somebody signed this, but it says 1935. So I think this was built in 1935, this water tower. And this, you see this, this is real, 
this is a real two by six and real two by fours. They don't cut them like that anymore. But what I'm going to do with this is got to clean all this out and it's going to have staircases going up a staircase and that's going to be lined with books. And then up at the top will be a reading room, meditation room. So I got 10 of these pomegranate trees. The idea is, I think I might try to blend it with the wine to get it, see if I can get some unique flavors. And here are some olive trees that I planted in the springtime, this last spring. And I, I'll have to look up the name of them. I can never remember, but they're, again, they were literally this tall. And I put this watering system in and I have it to where they come on it in the morning at six o'clock in the morning for about seven or eight minutes and then in the evening for another seven or eight minutes and that's it and then in the winter time i shut it off so i don't need, i don't use any fertilizers or anything like that out here it's just the natural soil and water this is an old fig tree i think this was it's got to be 70 years old at this point and this uh woodpecker lives in there often comes flying out at me but this thing produces the most beautiful figs during the summertime and I like to come out here now they're all gone now I like to come out and pick them and I have them with my uh, as dessert with my um, Greek yogurt it's just wonderful so when I was a kid this whole area was filled with all these different fruit trees and I would come out here at lunchtime and just climb up a tree and pick my fruit for my lunch and then, you know, as time goes on, I used to have these dreams about moving out of here and moving away and going to L.A. or New York and seeing Europe and things like that, which I did. And while I was away, things started dying off and they weren't being properly cared for. And then the drought hit about five years ago and it, it wiped out most of these trees out here. So I just decided to... Uh, you know, cut them down and, and replant them all and get a watering system in here. They're really just taken off. It's beautiful. These are my, uh, these are my carrots. Looks like they're about ready to start picking. I like to put them on the barbecue. This painting here, 1981. <clears throat> when I graduated high school, I went to Europe and backpacking, sleeping bag, traveling around, and I saw a number of Rembrandt paintings there. And I was just so completely blown away and inspired by his paint handling. And I felt that he could be my teacher. So when I got back here, and then I enrolled in a local junior college, I started painting. And this was the first painting that came out of this that time period. And I did a copy of Rembrandt. And it was my way of just almost like walking in his shoes, thinking that if I could, if I could paint with the same intention, that I would garner some sacred information about what it means to make art. So this is that painting. I started it, I remember I started on a Friday night, and by Sunday night I was finished, and I had never felt so alive in my life, and I didn't sleep. I couldn't sleep, I was too excited. But I felt like I had created magic. And so this is my painting. So this is a portrait I did of my mom, I think in 1981, maybe 82. And uh, this was our bird, Rainbow, and he was a scarlet macaw that we had. 
here in the house. And this is a copy of a Rembrandt painting. I did a copy of a Rembrandt, then I, I did another painting of the copy. So it's kind of this whole postmodernist thing I was doing. And this one I did a year later. And you can see I'm you know trying to do representational. Now I'm trying to figure out what paint can do and what emotions it can have. And I've been reading a lot about Matisse and how he would allow the raw canvas to show through and Cezanne. This is the last portrait that I did of my mom. And I did this in 2013. Yeah, she was um, a big part of my life, very inspirational and very kind and uh, caring person. No cherries yet, but I think next year I'll get a lot of cherries because this is only it's, it's just a year and a half old. This was another peach tree, a nectarine tree. This is a um, this is a, uh, a navel orange tree here. You can tell by the base at the bottom of it. Cantaloupes. Want a cantaloupe? And I got some watermelons in here. Yep. So these are my olive trees. I planted these with my son uh, almost two years ago. Again, they were little guys, and now they've they've really taken off. And I got a lot of olives on there. I got to pick them next couple of weeks. I'm going to have them pressed and. Um, to make some olive oil. I think back in 1976, I planted these trees. They were this tall. And, you know, we didn't know how big they were gonna get. So, and sadly, we, I planted them too close. So it, it created a wall, so I couldn't see, I didn't have this view. So last spring, I cut down six of these trees and opened it all up. And suddenly I've got this amazing view with this barn. The barn, they did a hundred year celebration for the barn four years ago. So whatever year that would be was when it was built. And this time of day, as the sun's going down, it just creates the most beautiful light. And I always make it a point to catch it. And I oftentimes sit up there and just sit and watch the light. And that's an alfalfa field across the street road there. And they cut it about every six weeks and they bale it, bale the hay, for he feeds his cattle and horses and stuff. This building here was it's original. It was an old barn that the teachers would tie up their horses and then uh, became a shop. So now it's my wood shop. A little messy right now. But this is where I uh, build all my stuff. Stretchers and the cabinets for the guest house and all those things. So it's nice to have this all right here. I'm going to redo this and get it functioning. It's a little chaotic right now. But I think every guy needs a shop. These are some pastels I've been doing recently, and these are going to go to an exhibition in Italy coming up. But having the garden out there in my orchard and watching the leaves and the flowering and the blossoms and everything, just there's something so beautiful about it. And these really tie into not the thing themselves, but the sensation of the memory of life and the creation of life.
These are a triptych for the Rose series. It was last spring. I was thinking a lot about the fragility of life and, you know, we, the beauty of life, the sacredness of life. And I wanted to paint something that was both abstract and realistic simultaneously. And I was being really inspired by my orchard out there. And again, you know, these, these shapes, these forms are really about my own physicality. And they are a fusion between my sort of conscious and subconscious. But then I started really painting these with these thin veils as if, you know, they're really, they're translucent, but they're in a moment of, you don't know if they're gonna, if they're becoming or they're passing. And last spring, my father passed away, so, and then the whole COVID thing hit, and life suddenly had a different meaning for me. And these paintings just started organically coming forth. And I was thinking of um, Gertrude Stein when she wrote a poem, a Rose is a Rose is a Rose, and first rose references the actual rose, the second rose references the word that references the rose. And the third word, rose, refer references the idea of a rose. So these are my ideas of a rose. A rose is a rose is a rose. And all these are from this series that I've been doing. It's so interesting for me when I'm working on these because they start the way I usually start a painting, which is just to be in this moment of allowing something to, allowing myself to make a mark. And then now they keep going in different directions that I'm not anticipating, which is real fun and exciting for me to work on them. Like this little line right here. I didn't know I was going to, that was going to happen. And it happened by a, my brush stroke being in the wrong place or it spread out too wide than what I was anticipating. But ultimately, you know, I'm painting things that I have a need to see. That's what these are really about. This is one of the Still Point series. Again, the T.S. Eliot poem at the Still Burning World, neither flesh nor fleshless. That is where the dance lies, the dance, the only dance, and so, that phrase, neither flesh nor fleshless, is the subtitle of this painting. And first it was, I was thinking about all the different tonalities of flesh tone, you know, from across the world, and I was playing with that idea. And then it, the red and the white and this cream colored started coming up. And the blood and the bones mixed with these different flesh tones underneath. So it's almost like inverting the human form. For me, an interesting thing is that th like this line and this line, you know, I just use these small brushes and I've spent hours and hours doing this. Um, so it becomes a real form of meditation for me. And ultimately that's what I would like it to be for the viewers. And with all this work, I don't, I want it to bypass the intellect and to go to a different place within the mind of the viewer so that they can't really even begin to intellectualize it. They just have to be in the moment and experience it. So the work becomes about the viewer being in the moment. These shapes here are what the pastel drawings are, but instead of looping back around themselves, they just become the thing themselves, that I then turn into a physical form. Mm -hmm.